Hi, I'm Scott Sellers, Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Watershed Institute. I'm here on behalf of the Board of Trustees to welcome you to this evening's Muriel Buttinger Lecture and thank you, our supporters, for your continued generosity. With your support, the Watershed Institute has recently enhanced the capabilities of its staff and expanded our outreach into our community to engage all citizens, all people, on our mission of clean water and a healthy environment for everyone. Thank you. We, will, we will, are continuing to do, make the best use of your resources and your support and your generosity, and we'll continue to do so. And now I'd like to introduce Jim Waltman, Executive Director of the Watershed Institute. Thank you, Scott, and thank you to all who have joined us tonight. It's my great honor and pleasure to serve as the Watershed Institute's Executive Director and to speak to you tonight at our annual Muriel Buttinger Lecture. This is an event that celebrates a great humanitarian to whom we owe a much, so much. I know that you'll find tonight's speaker extremely compelling um, and perhaps a bit challenging. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to, to her talks and our conversation. I wanna join Scott um, and thank all of you, um, particularly those who support the organization with your donations, your volunteer hours, and your personal acts of environmental stewardship. I'm exceptionally grateful to your uh, dedication to this organization, our mission, and our values. If you have not had any uh, past involvement with the organization, and maybe you're tuning in because you saw an email or a post on uh, a social media platform, let me extend a special welcome to you. We're delighted that you could join us this evening and hope to engage with you more in the future. A little bit about our organization. At the Watershed Scientists, advocates, educators, and other professionals work to keep our water clean, safe, and healthy. And this is really important work. It's hard work and it involves changing attitudes, changing behaviors, sometimes changing laws to advance our mission of water and the environment. It's an urgent mission that becomes truly more important with each passing day. Climate change and land use combine to raise the triple threats of flooding, droughts, and water pollution that damage our homes and businesses and the health of our communities. Now, the last time we held this event was late February, 2020. Um, I believe it was the last event we held in person before the world changed all around us. So that seems like a very long time ago. Um, and it's been a really tough and challenging year. So many have lost so much. Um, we've seen firsthand the ravages of climate change, communities that have burned, frozen, or drowned. And that's really a strong message that if we don't take truly bold action, that is our future. And of course, the reality of racial injustice and violence in America burst through our screens and onto our streets, challenging all of us to search deep within ourselves and to try to understand what's happening and what we can do about it. Now, like many, many institutions, this has been a period of great reflection at the watershed. Our board and staff have committed ourselves, both as individuals and as an organization, to embrace diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. To figure out what is this, what do these terms mean? How are we going to make real change in our lives and in our programs? How we do our work, with whom we do our work. We need to be better listeners uh, among many changes. And this is a long journey. Uh, it's a journey we take with great humility, realizing that for the majority of us at the watershed, and indeed for the majority of us in the environmental community, we may never fully comprehend what it means to be black, brown, Asian, or an indigenous American. So we need to have extreme humility as we tread these waters and, and walk this journey. Um, but we must try to understand as best we can. Um, if our organization and our movement are going to fully reflect our society, and if what we care about will be truly universal, 
issues and concerns for this country. We do know that the environmental concerns we have can disproportionately affect people of color and communities in poverty. According to a recent analysis of 38 major cities by the real estate brokerage Redfin, homes in US neighborhoods with large black or other minority populations that were once marked as undesirable for loans are in much greater danger of flooding caused by climate change. According to that study, there are now $107 billion worth of homes in areas that were redlined. Remember that? Redlining? Um, that are at high flood risk uh, compared to only $85 billion worth of homes in areas that were marked green for go, green for give the loans. So that is fundamentally and very obviously a mission related concern for us. But we also know that there's subtle racism that lurks beneath the surface in this country. And we need to better understand that and to work to address that. Um, I'm gonna steal maybe a little bit of the tonight's speaker's thunder because I, I had the great fortune to hear her speak. Um, she was at a, she led a workshop that was funded by the William Penn Foundation a few years ago. Um, she talked about how we often um, are very selective in whose stories we choose to tell and whose stories are forgotten. And I'm, I, I assume she'll talk about that tonight. Um, but I wanna mention an NPR story, um, very recent, it was last month, very current. It was about a black scientist and his research on the periodical cicada, right? So most of us are getting just this beautiful symphony of cicadas every night. So this is kind of top of mind. And I'm just gonna read a few paragraphs from the NPR story. Benjamin Boniker, a free black man born in 1731, is best known for a land survey that established the original borders of Washington, DC. But the naturalist also broke ground in another field, cicada research. Boniker first observed the cicadas at his Maryland home as a teenager in the 1740s and spent the next 50 years, 50 years documenting their unique life cycles, the 17 week periodicity of these incredible creatures. And his observations were among the very earliest known to science on the cicadas. But we never heard about this man, right? And why is that? His work was largely overlooked because of his race. And I think we understand um, that story and many others like his a lot, a lot more than we did just a, a year ago. So in addition to calling out racism when we see it, we need to do a better job of respecting and remembering and celebrating the contributions of all Americans, regardless of race or background, people like Benjamin Boniker. Now tonight, we remember and celebrate an inspirational figure who we call one of our own, who we're very proud of as someone who um, accomplished a great deal for humanity. Muriel Gardner Buttinger dedicated her life to improving the lives of others. A heroic figure in the underground Austrian resistance, Dr. Buttinger helped hundreds of Jews, socialists, and other persecuted people escape the fascists and the Nazis in the 1930s. Her story was told in modified form in the Academy Award winning 1977 movie, Julia, that of course starred Vanessa Redgrave and Jane Fonda. As a psychiatrist, she helped many more, including many troubled children and those behind that um, very fraught institution, the Trenton Psychological Hospital. And as a philanthropist, she supported many critical causes, including peace and arms control, civil rights, and the environment. And it was her philanthropy that literally transformed the watershed. Her gift of land, buildings, financial resources created what we now know as the Watershed Reserve. So this is an inspiring woman, um, a, a woman that we feel humbled to have played some role in her life. And she, of course, a, a great deal um, 
uh, great responsibility for the success of the organization. Now, tonight's Muriel Buttinger lecture is an extremely important leader in her own right and someone whose accomplishments and passions meet the moment. There was ever anyone um, who's prepared to speak, to seize the moment and speak to all of us about the issues of race and the environment. It's tonight's speaker. Dr. Carolyn Finney is a scholar in residence for environmental affairs at Middlebury College. Dr. Finney is the author of Black Faces, White Spaces, Reimagining the Relationship of African-Americans to the Great Outdoors. She is a storyteller and author and cultural geographer who studies identity, difference, creativity, and resilience. Dr. Finney previously served as an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky and as a visiting scholar at Wellesley College in Massachusetts. She's a Fulbright scholar and recipient of the Cannon National Parks Science Scholars Fellowship. She served on the US National Parks Advisory Board for eight years, assisting the National Park Service in its efforts to build relationships of reciprocity with diverse communities. And I'm so pleased she's here with us tonight. I just wish she was here in person so you can see her energy up firsthand. Um, but please join me in welcoming Dr. Carolyn Finney, tonight's Muriel Butler Lecturer. Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm gonna lighten up the situation. Yes, <laughs> yeah, we can see, cause that's what we all wanna do, right? We all wanna be able to see, hopefully. Um, I was getting all philosophical right in the beginning. Thank you for um, th that great introduction. Thank you for you and everybody at the Watershed Institute for inviting me. And I did a little homework because I really didn't know much about Muriel Buttinger. I mean, I'd seen Julia. And until you had told me that before, I did a lot of homework. So I, a little homework on who she was. And so I wrote here, I just want to um, thank her or, or make a special acknowledgement, excuse me, for her bravery, um, her clarity, her intentionality and her, her humanity. And what I will talk about a little bit later in the talk, what I see as her a labor of love. Um, yeah, so I'm ready to dive in because I have All a few right. things to say. Can I do it? Can Let's I do go. it? Let's go. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so to let everybody else know who's watching, I'm gonna put up some slides. And so for about 25, 30 minutes, I think you'll still see me, but there's some pictures because I like to show pictures when I'm talking. And then I know that Jim and I are gonna dive into conversation, maybe be able to take some of your questions uh, and try to keep it lively and moving. But I am going to share right now the beauty of different platforms. One second. I got some skills, it's happening. <laughs> All right, all right. So everybody can see? Yeah. Looks We're good. Great. Okay, so um, yeah, I wanted to call this playing the long game, you know. So I tend to do a lot of talks and a lot of engagements, and I would I want to say to all of you that since last May, um, when George Floyd was murdered, and Christian Cooper had his skin weaponized against him when he walked into Central Park, for me that was those were two really significant um, moments that happened not so far apart from each other, um, I watched my world also shift in terms of the way that I engaged. This is probably about the 122nd, 123rd time since last May that I've shown up either giving in talks like this or being asked to consult or advise or facilitate or write about issues having to do with race and the environment, power and privilege, the question of identity and land and environment, climate change, environmental justice, how do we have this conversation? So not only what is the conversation, but how do we have the conversation? Um, and I feel a couple of different ways about it. And this is my way of just being honest with you as I can on one, in one way. And I really appreciate Jim sort of acknowledging or what I heard him say was that my ability to meet this moment is in part because this is the work I've been doing for years. And, and also, and it's important that I say that in my own practice of how to do this work and meet this moment is um, I've been trying to build a public platform 
from an intersection of where I stand. I actually have a long background in the arts. I was an actor for 11 years before going back to school. And so I, my heart is in the arts. I went back to academia for a while. I actually left academia in a full-time capacity a few years ago on purpose so that I could work more fully. But also, I also work from the intersection of lived experience because what I understand, we all have that lived experience and it counts for something. It counts for the way we know the world, the way we show up in the world, the way we hold story, the way we share story. So I'm always looking for that moment and I, who knew what was gonna happen in 2020, right? Who knew about COVID, you know, the pandemic, who knew? Huh. Well, who didn't know about George Floyd getting murdered? I mean, we do have a long history of that. Yes, I said it just like that. Um, the election, we had a lot of things happening, but they all came together in kind of a perfect storm of a moment that I feel really, um, and I don't know if this is the right word, but I feel grateful that I was prepared and that I am fortunate enough to be able to do work that I love. It's taken me some years to get here so I can pay my rent doing the thing that I care about um, the most, but it's taken some time to get here and I will say at some cost. But the other thing that I wanna say is that I'm also exhausted because there's a lot of emotional labor involved. And because I believe human beings to be complex and complicated and able to do a lot of things together at the one time, I think it's important to hold both of those truths that I can feel grateful, I'm committed, I try to be intentional. I'm also exhausted. Um, and at times I despair around what is happening with us as people and what is happening with us in relationship to this earth that we call our home. And so I go back and forth between those things too, though but I'm in a, for the most part, I'm an entirely optimistic person here. Um, so yeah, so I always start with this idea of stories of now, and I just choose to put up these three images, one of the COVID representation of the COVID pandemic, you know, this famous mural of George Floyd after he was murdered, and the question, sort of the political conversation in this state that sort of um, privileges this, thought, this idea of red states, blue states, and that we're incredibly diverse and divided. Um, I actually wanna say we've always been diverse and divided arguably ever since Christopher Columbus lost his way and found his way here at the same time. I just think it's gotten more complicated and complex. And I would argue in part because we've never fully addressed all the things that we have been, right? That have got us to this point. Um, yeah, so some of that I wanna talk about. Um, a few weeks ago, when Derek Chauvin, um, the, the verdict came down on Derek Chauvin for the murder of uh, George Floyd, I was watching CNN and the white journalist Jake Tapper was talking to the black journalist Don Lemon about it. And Jake Tapper said to John Lemon, Don, Don Lemon, he said, um, you know, in 2016, when Black Lives Matter was kind of, you know, revving up full force, you had a lot of politicians and some other famous people who have a public platform who were kind of reticent about acknowledging Black Lives Matter, of saying it out loud, of even speaking about it at all. And he said, but you know, four years later, 2020, suddenly you've got all kinds of people not afraid to say Black Lives Matter. In particular, I, I remember a few months ago in the Washington Post, um, Hillary Clinton, was suddenly, she said white supremacy at least five times in an article that she wrote in the Washington Post. I mean, suddenly people are saying these things more out loud more than ever before. And he looked at Don Lemon, he said, so don't you think there's been a sea change, you know, since 2016? And what Don Lemon said when he looked at Jake Tapper was, well, there's been a sea change in terms of awareness. And I'm gonna add, and wokeness, but he didn't think there'd been much of a sea change in terms of practice. And this is the place that I really want to start. And I'm not putting down wokeness and I'm not putting down awareness because I think before you can actually change practice, you have to become aware. You have to become awake. And sometimes you have to reflect on what that actually means in order to have strong um, intention in terms of what it is you want to do. But what does it mean to actually shift to practice? Um, and some of what I was taking away from what Jim was saying before I came on here was the struggle, I think, for a lot of organizations, institutions. Let me just say the thing. For a lot of predominantly white, environmental institutions, organizations, 
sectors, groups um, to really meet this moment and figure out what that means, right? And I have actually great empathy for a lot of people in that position because I can't imagine in the same way that I heard Jim reference that perhaps for a lot of people who are of European descent, they can't imagine what it's like for a black person, brown person, an indigenous person, an Asian person at this moment. Well, I wanna to say to you as someone who is African-American, I can't imagine what it would be like for somebody who is white at this moment to feel their very foundation shaking under them in a very different way. And so that's sort of what I wanna bring up today. And I'm just gonna throw a few things on the table, you know, so I can get it all in 30 minutes and so that Jim and I can launch into a conversation with each other. Um, a couple of years ago in 2017, a photographer named Chris Buck, uh, he did a series of photographs. He called it, Let's Talk About Race. And I think it was in um, Oprah's magazine in O. And I'm calling it Flipping the Script. And this is one of the images he had up there. So you see this young white girl, she's in a toy store and she's looking at a shelf with a series of dolls, but all the dolls are black and brown. He had a series of other photographs. He had one of a nail salon where you had a bunch of women of Asian descent sitting in a chairs, getting pedicures from women of European descent and so on, right? He was trying to make the point, what does it mean to flip the script? How does that change? the practice? And what do we actually have to be prepared to do? What skill sets do we have to build? What capacity do we have to build? What do we have to be prepared to acknowledge in order to flip the script? How might we see differently if we flip the, the, flip the script? Please don't ask me to say that three times fast. You know, when I think about the question of white supremacy, when I think about the question of whiteness, you know, and I always say this to audiences I speak to, whiteness isn't a bad thing. Nobody can help the skin they were born in. And I really mean that. I can't help it. You can't help it. We're all born with what we have here. But it is a construction in this country. And it was constructed as being at the center of how we see and do everything here. And so it doesn't even address the diverseness of whiteness because Whiteness is also incredibly diverse. And like anybody else of any other skin color, we're more than one thing. We are all more than one thing. And yet we have used whiteness as a way to determine who has value, what has value, what stories count, what stories don't count. We've legislated it. We've decided it for curriculums in our education. We, we've decided it in terms of who gets to be our neighbor, who gets to buy land. It just has rolled down the hill in so many different ways. What happens when we dissenter that perspective? I'm not talking about canceling, because I really don't buy into cancel culture. I don't see what the point is, though I understand the impulse, right, and the feeling behind it. Um, what happens when we dissenter a singular perspective and way of understanding the world, a singular story of the way to understand the environment and make space for a more relational understanding, a more complicated and complex one, a point of view that is going to ask us to get better at not only healing, reconciling our past and others, but also reconciling with ourselves and healing ourselves about who we've been collectively as a country in order to think about and talk about authentically who we can be, right, as we move forward together. So I've often told this story a couple of years ago. Um, so tomorrow I'm getting on a plane for the first time since February 2020, and I, I'm used to flying every week. So it's been, I'm having a lot of anxiety about going to the airport, but I'm also incredibly excited to be out in the world again and around people. A few years ago, I was standing um, in line to get on a plane. This was at SFO. Um, and I was standing behind a South Asian woman and there were two white women standing behind me and we thought we were getting on. And then suddenly the, uh, one of the flight attendants gets on the speaker and says, there's going to be a delay. And you know, when that happens and we all started looking at each other and talking to, and introducing ourselves and getting into conversation. And it somehow got to the South Asian woman who said that her job, she um, was to fly around the world. She'd been to 75 countries and she talked to businesses about diversity. And she was saying that she was all quite serious talking to us. And I think I must have said something about the importance of empathy, you know, to feel a way about another person, particularly one who is different from yourself. Um, and she said to all of us, 
that empathy and sympathy are nice, but who do you stand with? And I was like, whoa, later I got on the plane, I wrote that down in my moleskin journal. I was like, who do you stand with? And I've been thinking about that because in order to know who you stand with, you have to know where you stand, right? Because we're all biased. I'm biased, you're biased, everyone is biased. And let's take the judgment off bias for a second because what's often used as judgment, actually bias is a point of view. It's a subjectivity. You you bring, you know, who you are, your experience in the world to bear upon anything it is you're trying to understand. We've all got that. It is not the same as prejudice or racism, but boy, it's like a close cousin that if you're not paying attention to your bias, if you're not aware of what your bias is, if you're not aware of those boundaries, it can tip over into that other place. I'm actually, it's a conversation I can have about Amy Cooper with Christian Cooper that I often think, you know, without knowing her well or knowing her at all, actually, that something like that might have happened in that moment, right? That she responded the way she did to Christian Cooper. And so in order for me to tell you something about all the things I'm hoping that we're all thinking about at this time, and that I'm inviting you to consider, I have to tell you something about my own bias and my own perspective. So I grew up um, 30 minutes outside of New York City in Westchester County. But what I want to talk about first, I have to back up a little bit and talk about my parents, Henry and Rose, that you're seeing up here in the corner. This picture was taken in the 1950s. They grew up in Floyd, Virginia. Uh, they grew up very poor. They grew up black. They both have a high school education. My father went off to fight in the Korean War. And when he came back from the Korean War, like a lot of black people who lived in the South, he thought he'd have a better chance of getting a job if he went north. And he already had a sister who had moved to New York. She was a nurse. She'd gotten married. She seemed to be doing well. So he and my mother moved north. My father got two job offers. One he got from a place in Syracuse, New York, which is about five hours north of New York City, where he could be a janitor. The other job that he ended up taking was only 30 minutes outside New York City. A very wealthy Jewish family that owns a lot of real estate had a 12 acre estate and they needed full time caretakers for this estate. Um, and that's the job my parents took. So my father was the chauffeur, gardener. Um, my mother was a sometime housekeeper um, and lived in the house that you're seeing here because you had to be on this property full time. I wanna show you some more pictures. The estate is stunning. So you have fruit trees, vegetable gardens, flower gardens. Um, there was a, a small pond with fish. Uh, there was a swimming pool. I mean, this was and is a very stunning piece of property. So my parents took this job. It's also in a very wealthy all white neighborhood when, we, when they moved in in the late 50s. Um, we were the only family of color in that neighborhood well into the 90s when a Japanese American woman moved in. She was there for a little while and then she moved out. When my parents got there, they thought they couldn't have kids. And that's kind of a side story about what can happen to women, regardless of your skin color. But if you're poor at a time that my mother had to go into the hospital, so she thought she couldn't have kids. So the owners helped them adopt me. Um, and I was adopted through Spence Chapin, which is a Jewish adoption agency in New York City. And then soon after that, two years later, they had my first brother, Greg. And then about six years after that, they had my second brother, I call him Marcus, but his first name is John. Uh, so me and my brothers, the owners only generally only came up on weekends and holidays. So we had run on this place like it was our own private park. This is where we learned how to swim, be in the woods, you know, run, all the stuff you do, bike outside. This is where we were able to do it day in and day out. Um, but the story that I like to tell people, just when I started to get a sense of myself and the color of my skin, and really, I think I al always had a sense of it, it's hard not to see it when you're looking around you at all the other families in the neighborhood and they don't look like you, but also you are always reminded that you don't own this place. I mean, in the sense of private property, right? When I was nine years old, uh, so me and my brothers went to a public school, Amerindic Avenue School, and I was. these were the days when you could feel comfortable about letting your kids walk home. And I was walking home, I was right around the corner from the house and there were always policemen patrolling this area. And this white policeman in his car stopped me. He wanted to know where I was going. And I gave him the address. And he looked at me and he said, oh, do you work there? And I'm thinking I'm nine. And all I said was, no, I live there because I was confused. He let me go. I went home. I told my parents. My father got so angry. He called the police station. He asked them not to bother me and my brothers again. And they didn't. But as an adult, I have to think about and I always question the logics of that policeman's question. 
I was a nine-year-old girl coming home at a certain time of day with my school bag. He wasn't asking me, was I okay? Did I know where I was going? You know, did my parents know where I was? Whatever. He wanted to know where I was going and did I work there even at nine years old, right? This was the late 60s. So um, I, I, I want to jump ahead now to um, 1990s. The ma patriarch of the family had passed away and the matriarch of the family was now very sick. And she was concerned what was going to happen to my parents who'd been carrying this for the land at this point, about 40 years full time. And to her credit, she thought about trying to keep them on this land. The land was worth over four, $3 million at the time, over $125,000 a year in property taxes. For many different reasons, it wasn't going to work to keep them here. So she had a house built for them and they landed on Leesburg, Virginia, because my youngest brother at this point was married with kids, was settled. Me and my, my other brother were also gone, but I'm never settling down somewhere. So um, they picked that place. They had a beautiful house built for them. Um, the matriarch of the family passed away with my father at her bedside um, because these relationships are complicated. Uh, the new owner moved in. My parents stayed on until 2003. So up until 2003, right, this is home. This will always be home for me, right? This is always where I'd go back to on holidays to visit my parents. 2003, the new owner finally found a family that held from the Dominican Republic to take over the job my parents had been doing. So in 2003, my parents moved to their house in Leesburg. Now, this was a point when I had returned to school. I was working on my doctorate. I'd been thinking about gender and environmental issues, women and environmental issues. And this is when I really started thinking about race because it became personal. The thing that I tell everybody, and actually the thing I'm always trying to suggest for everyone else too, is that this work is personal. It is personal, it is intimate, it is political, it is all those things, as well as being professional. It means something to me, right? Because I'm in the story too. About five or six years after my parents had moved to their lovely house in Virginia on a half an acre of land, um, they get a copy of a letter and the letter was from one of the old neighbors, and it had been sent from the Westchester Land Trust to all the neighbors to let them know that a conservation easement had now been placed on this estate. This is why this fence is here, that you're looking at this iron gate, hadn't been there when I lived there, and that sign basically says something about the land trust. A conservation easement had been placed on the estate. So I got a copy of this letter, pictures of the estate. It talked about all the wildlife and environmental values of this estate, where it sits in the watershed, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the letter, it thanked the new owner for his conservation mindedness. He'd been on the land for maybe five, six years or so at that point. There was nothing in the letter thanking my parents who'd cared for that land for nearly 50 years. And just like that, they were gone. They were gone from the environmental history. You know, their labor was gone. You know, everything was gone. I was gone. The whole family was gone. And this is really when I started asking the question, whose story counts, whose ownership counts. When I started thinking about the myth that black people don't fill in the blanks when it comes to the environment, because it is a myth. Black people, brown people, white people, we all do everything all the time. That story about Benjamin Boniker, we've been around just like everybody else doing things, engaging, producing knowledge of, producing love for, labor for, the land, the environment, all aspects of it, all the time for the last 450 years. But just like that, one stroke of the pen, we were gone. I'm not saying the people in the Westchester Land Trust were bad. That's not what I'm saying. I don't want you to hear that. But what I'm hearing, what I'm saying is that privilege has the privilege of not seeing itself. Right. You know, it is just really interesting that when people are looking through that singular perspective, that singular way of doing things that has been justified, codified and affirmed over and over again, it's not necessary to look and consider anything else. And now, right, for me, we're at a point of making it necessary. So we're at this point of convergence, right? I think we've always been here. We've always had this opportunity. And for me, for me, here we are again. I put up these images of where you can see representations of enslaved African people, of Mexican families crossing the border, of Japanese internment, the pollution and the violence we do to the landscape, indigenous removal and genocide, um, 
the invisibility, the erasure of the Chinese who worked the railroad and the story goes on and on and on. And I like to put those images up here right next to the famous picture of Gifford Pinchot, who really coined conservation in this idea of forest management and how we might manage the resources for our use. And John Muir, who really thought about wilderness and preservation along with President Roosevelt. That photo was taken in 1903. They're in Yosemite National Park on overhanging rock. All three men, thoughtful, intentional, right? And privileged. And privileged is not a bad word. I got some privileges too, just not the same privileges in the same time in the same way. And to understand, you know, I, for me, I needed to ask the question as they were having those conversations about how we human beings are in a relationship to this place we call home, this environment and this land, what else was going on at the same time? How could I think about that conversation without considering that in 1862, when the Homestead Act was passed, for the most part, if you were of European descent, you could go out on a, and grab up to 160 acres of land. And if you stayed on it for a four or five years, and if you built a structure and if you garden, that land was then yours free and clear. And if we know nothing else in the United States, we know that land is never just about land. It is about economic and political power. It is about legacy. It is about the right to say that you belong here. And you know, we die for the right to say that we belong here, right? And so when you think about three years later, enslaved Africans are freed. They're given 400,000 acres of land initially until white plantation owners said, what have we done? We just gave black people that we enslaved as our property 400,000 acres of land. And land is never just about land. It is about economic and political power. It is about legacy. It is about the right to say, you belong here. And they said, I don't think so. And they took all that land back. And while there was conversation about, should they be able to participate in the Homestead Act? And yes, you do have a handful of people of African descent who were homesteaders for the most part, they were not allowed to participate. I don't even have to tell you another thing today to start to understand how the inequality got placed in a very particular way. And oh, did I forget to mention, in order for any of that land to be available in the first place, the indigenous people had to be removed and or killed. All this land was stolen. No matter how far we get down the road, all of it. So our initial, like I always say, blood in the soil. It's, there's blood in the soil. But it's not the only thing in the soil, but there's blood in the soil. There's a legacy of that, right? That's in our collective DNA as who we are as a country, right? We're holding that. Ralph Peck, the quote I have up here is a Haitian um, filmmaker who, if you haven't seen it yet on HBO, he recently did um, uh, uh, a four part documentary called uh, Exterminate All the Brutes. And man, it is hard watching. It is beautiful. He really looked at the myth of America. He looked at everything from slavery to indigenous genocide, to the Holocaust, to land ownership. I mean, and he layered it with personal story and historical story and just, he, he doesn't provide any easy answers. But for me, he does provide a way in. And one of the quotes that I take from him is the past has a future we never expect. The past has a future we never expect. For me, it's not good or bad. It's just something for us to chew on and imagine. And the future is for me up to us in so many ways. And here we are again at this moment of convergence, thinking about how that future might be different. One of the other things I've been saying a lot to organizations and groups that I speak to is, well, again, I love to meet some James Baldwin that everything that can be faced, but nothing can be changed until it is faced, is that I recognize that organizations, institutions, and individuals have worked really hard to learn what they've learned about the environment, whether it's you know forest lands, mountains, water, rivers, trees, you know the work that you do, right? You've worked really hard. I'm not interested in throwing that away. I'm not interested in throwing you away. I'm not interested in throwing anybody away. But what I do say is that when we understand an institution or an organization that's been in place for 20, 40, 50, 100 years, I want you to remember that most of those organizations 
would never have invited me to come speak or anybody who looks like me, let alone be part of the conversation. So I say that we don't have to throw away the baby with the bathtub. You know, we don't have to throw away the baby and the bathwater. We do have to throw away the bathtub. That is actually what I want to say. We don't need to throw away the baby in the bathwater, but we definitely need a new bathtub. And that's one of the reasons why it's so challenging. Because what does that mean? I always say to people, if you're comfortable doing this work in diversity, that I would challenge you that you're not actually doing the work. Because there is nothing comfortable about doing this work. There is nothing comfortable. And it is not, in my opinion, about anybody's comfort, which isn't the same as creating security for people. I think that's different, right? I believe it's important for people to feel safe. But discomfort, this isn't about our comfort. Um, ooh, I'm not even looking at my notes because this is what happens to me when I get on a roll. Um, so I'm kind of saying it, and I'm just going to say it in a different way. I think we've been bamboozled when it comes to the larger environmental narrative in this country. I think we've been bamboozled on a lot of narratives in this country. The narrative in and of itself is not wrong. The narrative, the dominant environmental narrative, the kind of manifest destiny, this idea of all that we've built, we've pulled ourselves up by the bootstrap, we've just moved forward, John Muir, Aldo Leopold, Henry David Thoreau, um, Rachel Carson, Gre um, Greta Thunberg, all of them did amazing work. Right? I love me some Greta Thunberg, so don't mishear me here. I love me some Rachel Carson. You know, I mean, Henry David Thoreau, right, as individuals. And this is actually not their doing. But the idea that we've placed this singular line, singular perspective and way of understanding and engaging the environment at the loss of everybody else. What did it mean for black communities living during Jim Crow that were engaged and loved the land, that were fisher people, that worked in the forests, that were, um, I don't know, farmers? You know, we know that there's a big story about USDA not giving them loans. There are so many stories. What did it mean when 3,000 people of Chinese descent helped to build our railroads and that were left out of the final famous picture at the Golden Spike? What did it mean for those Japanese families in California who had farms and land that they loved and lost it all because of the way that they looked? What does it mean and still mean for indigenous people who are still trying to get us to see differently about who we are and who we've been and who they are and who we can be. What does it mean when we still want to hang on to a narrative that doesn't let any of that in? And to remember that, you know, I joke around a lot, you know, when you think about a park and you think about that sign at the park letting us know as human beings that this is the park boundary and we can come in. And I, we already know that wildlife pays absolutely no attention to those signs, right? Wildlife and is going to go where it needs to go. Well, I'm here to tell you racism pays no attention to those signs either. And just because it's a nice park, a nice beach, a nice mountainside, it doesn't mean the racism stopped at the gate. I wish that were true. I would have moved into a park a long time ago if that were the case, me and a whole lot of other people. But that's not the case, right? Because wherever we go collectively, there we are. And we bring our history with us. So as I kind of get near the end, a couple of more things that I want to say here. Um, I want to talk about risking to gain for a second. Um, I have a labor of love up here, but there's actually... I want to put something on here. Now I'm going to come back. I'll come back to that. Okay, so this is my dad. Uh, I want to sort of talk about the idea of labor of love. And I mentioned that when I was talking about Muriel um, Buttinger earlier. And I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, I got my slides in the wrong order because I, I really want to say something about risking to gain before I say this. But um, I'm going to say it anyway, and I'll come back to it. Uh, I'm going to leave this slide up here. So. One of the things that I always say to people in terms of it's not about being comfortable, that we have to be willing to take a risk in order to gain. And taking a risk in order to gain is really different than taking a risk because you're afraid of not losing something. And this is just my humble opinion, but I believe some of the resistance that we're seeing right now in this country because people are taking risks in order not to lose what they already have. 
right? And so I want to think about and want us to think about what does it mean collectively to take a risk in order to gain? Um, what does it mean to leverage your position? It means you have to know something about what your position is and what you're willing to give up, what, you know, in terms of leadership frameworks. Um, what does it mean to attend to impacts, the impacts of your good intentions? And I actually have some examples and stories, and maybe Jim will ask me about that, and I'll share that with you, of organizations that I think are actually trying to do that. Um, what does it mean to self-reflect? So, yeah, many of us have been self-reflecting on this time. You know, so now what are we prepared to do uh, in this moment? What are we willing to let go of in order to do it? Uh, I think a lot about organizations and people um, in positions of power who in a very well-meaning way talk about helping and outreach. And people who know me know I don't use the term outreach anymore as someone who's been outreach too, because outreach is not the kind of relationship I'd want to have with someone. You know, outreach means I can outreach to you, bring you to my table, make a place for you there. And then you have to learn everything about my table, my culture and everything that I do here. But I really don't have to learn much about you at all. And nothing really changes. Change may mean that I build a relationship with you and I have to learn something about you. And actually, we may have to get rid of the table because something has changed here. And that's actually a good thing because now we've created a potential space of emergence and everybody's uncomfortable, not just the person you invited to the table. So I want to come back to this as um, the last story that I want to share um, before I sort of open it up with Jim about the idea of labor of love and what I what I mean by that. So you're looking here at you see that hydrangea bush, but there's a tree, a small tree there, and it's actually Punis pendula is the, the Latin name. It's a weeping cherry tree. And for my parents' 40th wedding anniversary, while I was still living on the land, my father gave my mother this tree. Um, this picture here is the last time that they were on the land. It was 2003. The new owner took a picture of them in front of this tree. And I keep this picture on my desk. Um, and so I, last summer, one of the many things that I found happened is that a lot of predominantly white organization institutions are really thinking about how to do things differently. The New York Botanical Gardens reached out to me about doing a residency, which I'll be doing next month with them. And I started telling them the story about this weeping cherry tree. I told them the story of how, you know, my parents' labor on this land has been erased in terms of the Conservation Land Trust organization. And they said, you know, we're the New York Botanical Gardens. I bet we can get access to that estate, get a sampling of the tree, bring it back to the New York Botanical Gardens, and then tell the story about your family. And this was last summer. We were having this conversation over Zoom. I'm moved. I'm thinking this will be amazing, this amazing. But that wasn't enough. In 2019, I had the privilege of speaking at um, one of the Telluride Film Festivals. The theme that year was equity. So Robin D'Angelo, who wrote White Fragility, myself, Jose Gonzalez, James Mills, a bunch of people you may have heard of, we were all asked to come and speak. And I told, I had 25 minutes to do my thing in front of an audience like 900. And my slides were on in the background. And I called it Whose Story Counts, just like Jim said. And I told this story of my family on the estate, a few other things I said as well. And there were all kinds of filmmakers and people in the audience. Um, and last summer, one of those filmmakers who I hadn't met then, a white woman named Irene Taylor, who's uh, won Emmys, Oscar nominated, reached out to me and said, Would I, could we have a Zoom conversation? I said, sure. So we got on and she said HBO has commissioned her to do a documentary about trees. And she wants to tell a story of different trees, but always have a, a human side to that story about that tree. So some kind of relationship or connection. And she said she realized in thinking about the story I told, she had nothing in here about black people. And she wanted me to help her think about what that might look like. And I said, well, the obvious thing is actually, you know, to talk about black people in trees and lynching. And she said, yeah, I'm not the person to do that. And I said, yeah, you know, black people aren't only the bad thing that happened to them in the environment. And I told her this story to have her think about it a little bit, how she might think more broadly. At the end of the day, she loved the story and decided she's going to tell the story of my family and the sweeping cherry tree. And so as one of the many stories that she would tell. So come December. We, we uh, you know, we're, we're, we're gearing up for this. We're going to do it this summer. She's going to come to the estate. We're going to get access. Westchester Land Trust is on board. Now, we haven't gotten the new owners yet on board, but everybody else is on board. But the land trust decides, you know, let me go on there and make sure that the tree is still there. So I give them this picture again to show them. Here's the tree. This is where you can look at it. It's near the gardener's cottage. You, you can't miss it. At the end of December, this is the picture that the land trust sent to me. 
the whole thing has been landscaped. The tree is gone. Now, the new owners are not the owners who knew my family. They, those owners had sold the property yet again. So these are new owners who don't know me or my family. Um, I'm not saying they're bad people. So I just want to be real clear here that that's not what I'm saying. I don't know them, but it's been landscaped. So whatever small memory was there about my parents and their labor, it was gone. And for three days, I was devastated. I sent these pictures and told the story. The filmmaker was devastated. We just, the New York Botanical Gardens was devastated. It was just, the, the pain and the anger for me was deep. And I thought, well, the whole, this whole project is gone because, you know, what, what can we do now? And at the end of three days, I thought about it some more. And I said, you know what? This is actually the truth of what happens in America all the time. Why not tell this story? And then I started thinking about it more and said, and what if we could get the new owners to agree to a replanting of the tree? As of a week and a half ago, it's taken a long time. Everybody's into it. As a matter of fact, the land, the person making the film, who was originally going to tell global story of trees, decided just to focus on North America with five stories, one of them being this story. Um, I wrote a personal letter to the, the new owners who are both medical doctors who live on the property. I don't know them, but they opened up their, they said, we're willing to hear what you have to say. And I made a personal entreaty and they came back within 30 minutes and said, yes, we will do this. So at this moment and this summer, we have all of us descending on this. And I'm telling you this story because this is how everybody becomes accountable for the story and the memory, not just myself and my family, but the New York Botanical Gardens is a major institution and a holder of those larger stories of flora and fauna. Um, the Westchester Land Trust, whose job it is to protect in perpetuity landscapes like this. The owners who have the privilege to care for and enjoy this landscape on a daily basis. And the filmmaker who is part of that media institution that gets to tell a different kind of story and not just our story, but our story in relationship to other stories around trees, because that's the way it always is. It is always in relation. We can make the choice to close our eyes or to deny or erase or ignore. But if nature tells us anything, it tells us we are always in relation. This is my risk to gain slide, right? I just love that picture of the boy jumping, right? And I guess I want to say something here about this quote because justice is what love looks like in public. The other reason I think of it as a labor of love, because at the end of the day, whether we say it or not, I want to ask you the question, who do you love? What do you love? When we joke around around ride or die in terms of the environment, for me, we can't do the work in the way we need to do the work for non-human nature unless we're also willing to do that work for ourselves and our relationship to each other. That is how we move forward. And it is a long game. The day of the inauguration, the thing that moved me, aside from Amanda Gorman, who was amazing, was actually when Senator Roy Blount gifted Joe Biden this painting. And I was kind of watching it, you know, half-heartedly because I've been watching it all day. And he talked about this, and I thought, oh, it's another bucolic painting from the 1850s. I've seen a lot of those landscape paintings with the rainbow. It's lovely. Until he said that Robert S. Duncanson was a black man. And I'm telling you, honestly, it shocked me. Not because he chose a black painter or because Dr. Biden, um, Joe Biden's wife, chose the painting. But that a black man who was alive in 1859 of European and African ancestry was living at a time when black bodies were enslaved, were property, had the audacity to make a painting with a rainbow, rainbows that are about, they're symbolic for possibility. Um, they're symbolic for imagination, everything that's ahead. And for me, the only way I can kind of justify that idea in my head is that he must have been playing the long game. He must have just been imagining beyond his own lifetime what might be possible. I was born exactly 100 years later after this. And I believe in part I become possible because he believed I would become possible and that the rest of us become possible. So the last thing that I want to say to you very briefly um, is I'm looking at my notes here and thinking, what do I really want to say? 
I want to say that um, we're playing the long game, right? That sy systemic change is about playing the long game. We are taking a risk in order to gain. We're looking in the mirror and are seeing perhaps for the first time in a different way. We are reminded of everything we don't know and everything we do know. We are moving beyond awareness and wokeness and leaning into practice. And it's gonna cost us something. It's gonna cost us something to do this. I watched lately a conversation with Brian Stevenson, who's this African-American lawyer and founder of the Equal Justice Initiative. This is a guy, he's, he's at the level of Muriel Buttinger, the work that he's been doing to get people off death row and just challenge our legal system to think differently, particularly about black people who are in prison and children who are in prison. And I watched this about him and there was a couple of quotes that he said that really moved me. Um, one of them was, he said, we are more than the worst thing we've ever done. We are more than the worst thing we've ever done collectively in this country. And I realize that the part of the resistance at addressing some of the bad things we've done collectively as people is because it doesn't feel good to feel bad. But we are more than that. And imagine if we can actually be accountable for it and build up our skill set. What does it mean to be accountable? It doesn't mean to be canceled. It means to open our heart more fully and that there's something better waiting for us and we are better than better able to meet that. So yes, it will cost us something, but we are worth it. Thank you. Carolyn, you left me, you, you you have left me speechless. I, I I have to say I was I was wondering if your emotion and your passion would come through across the screen like it did that day, whatever it was, two three years ago, and you've blown me away. I need a nap. I need a shower. I, I um, I'm very grateful you've brought something to to this organization. I don't think we've ever seen, which is authenticity and telling a story and 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 sharing pain and and truth I, I so I, I i'm i'm left here wondering what keeps you going you told me this is the third speech you've done this week 100 and some odd um are, are you optimistic that that you and and so many others that are working on this toiling away are making change what yes what's so, your outlook right now so um I'm, you know i'm well, even when I'm depressed and I've been kind of, you know, the last month or two, I think I just, I started to feel a little burnt out around it. And I, you know, I like to fill up all the blank place spaces on my calendars with these opportunities because I feel like this is the work that I do. I, I live alone. I moved to Burlington in 2019. So when the, when the uh, pandemic happened, it's been a kind of a lonely year, except for the work. Right, which I've been engaging with people in this way. But I am an optimistic person. I, I want to tell people two short examples of things that have happened lately. And these are the kinds of things, you know, part of what I miss about engaging with all of you in person is that we'd be in front of each other, right? We'd be getting all the all the energy and the and the magic and the buzz, and then we go out afterwards for drinks or dinner, or you know, we'd be we get to know each other a little bit. And for me, I'm not get I don't get that back, you know, the way that I'm used to getting that back because it's hard to do it on the screen. But what I found, two examples, um, one organization that's from out west that um, I want to leave them unnamed only because I'm not sure that they would want me to let them know this. Uh, I had given them a couple of months ago, I had done a thing for their organization and they identified as a predominantly white organization, uh, environmental organization. And I, uh, a few weeks ago, the woman that, you know, I had been working with, you know, called me up on the phone. And when I answered the phone, she sounded really troubled. And I thought, oh gosh, did my talk not go well? Did, you know, what happened? I figured I said something. And she said to me, well, she goes, I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you this. And she said, are you on social media? And I said, yeah, but I, you know, I don't get there. I don't look at all the time. She said, because on Instagram, um, after you gave your talk and, you know, spoke with us, somebody from our organization posted, you know, how much they, you know, how great your talk was. But she says they said things like, you know, how well spoken you were. And she froze when she said that, right? So for those of you who may not understand, you know, how that can be perceived as a microaggression. You saw a black person is so articulate, you know. And, you know, what was so funny for me on the other side of the phone is I'm thinking she's going to say, I thought I was going to, I had done something wrong. 
I, and I was ready, like my back, I was like ready, like what, how, what? or that I was gonna get mad. And I almost chuckled, but not at her. Like I said, oh, that, I can handle that. And I said, you know, here's the thing. Um, and, she, and then she said, we took the site down and I wanted to call you immediately and see if that had any impact on you. And I said, I said, I'm gonna say two things to you. I say, one, you and I have been building a professional relationship. You know, I've talked to you multiple times. I came in. Um, the message was saying thank you to me. We're showing gratitude. So the first thing at one human being to another is I'm going to presume good intent. And yes, if I had read it, I would have, my eyebrow would have gone up a little bit. But I said, perhaps the person didn't know how to say, well, she does all this and that over here and she brought it in and she communicates and she invites and I don't know, but it was hard, but it was good. And, and so what they said was I was well-spoken <laughs> because I could do it. Who knows, right? I said, but more importantly, you're actually doing the work right now. You called me, you didn't have to. I would have never seen it, right? And, and it didn't end there two days ago. She, for the whole staff, they're creating a blog. They all do this reading on microaggression. She's using it as a story. She was writing to me to ask me, was it all right to still use my name? Because she brought out gender bias, like all of it. And I was just, I was jumping up and down on the other side. Like I was over there going, ah, ah, ah. Because, you know, she wasn't asking me to fix anything. She didn't ask me to fix anything. You know, yeah. she's like, but I wanted to let you know, and I was just like, oh my God, can I, hurrah, I'm supporting, I'm dancing, this is what you're doing. The other story that I want to tell you was another group, um, and Ithaca Botanical Gardens, actually, back in February, I had given a talk, and the organization um, is predominantly white, but they work with a lot of diverse community groups in the area of Ithaca, New York, and the woman who is an executive director of that organization who is white had sent me an email a couple of weeks ago. And she said, I've been putting off writing this to you um, for a number of different reasons. But one of the things she wanted to do, she says, we have this wonderful woman, this black woman working for us who loves your work, loves you. She's our communications person. And I was thinking, she goes, I noticed I did two workshops with them and I gave a talk. So I engaged multiple times over a period of time with them. And she said, I noticed how much you gave her yourself all the time. And I must have told her that I have no infrastructure, right? Part of my challenge has been, as Jim will attest to, it takes me a little time to get an email back. No, to him. But it's because I'm getting so much coming in and I have, there's only me doing it, right? And she must have heard me say it or just realized that she says, she goes, what we want to do as an organization, I realized in terms of being an ally, how we can stand with you. We believe in the work that you're doing. How can I assist you with that? Well, what if you hired this woman part-time, which means we would probably lose her and I don't want to lose her. She says, that's why it took me three months to write you because I knew what might happen. But she said, but this feels like the right thing to do. Not only did she do that, but you know, I've actually never hired anybody to work for me. So people have been telling me for a while to hire an assistant. But I've been reticent because I come from the tough it out family, you do it all yourself. But I've also been reticent because I don't know how to do that rightly. Like, what does that look like? And she started saying, she goes, I will help you. I will walk you through the process. I said, that, that, again, I went, ah! I said, that's it right there. And both those things in part came out of relationship, right? It didn't come out of an outreach for, it didn't come out of, um, you know, just some misdirected or misguided idea of like, what can I do for you without knowing who you are and what you need? It came out of a kind of paying attention and a willingness to understand it was going to cost them both something. It actually cost them both something, the organizations to do that. Um, that's why I am optimistic. You know, there are stories that are happening in real time. You know, I actually, I know that there's resistance out there, but the fact of the matter is, I'm booked into next year. So that's not, you know, that's not, I'm not saying I'm so great. What I'm saying is, and a lot of people I know who look like me were so, you know, there's a moment here that I think there's genuine hunger for it. And yes, I'm not naive. I know that some of that is superficial, but I'm going to take whatever it is because I, you, it may be superficial for you, but I know what it is for me. So if you let me in the door, I know what I'm bringing. And my job is to meet you where you are and strategize and duck and weave and whoosh, do some psychological trickeration, as John Legend would say, <laughs> to get you with me on this thing before you know what happened. 
and then you know take it and go forth and multiply. <laughs> that is, that Car is Carolyn, you you know you said something um, earlier, kind of early in your talk that uh, was maybe the only surprise, and and I I thank you for it. Okay. Um, which was empathy that you spoke as a black woman for a white man, you know, and, and I'll be honest. I, so I've been doing this work for more than 30 years, right? I'm, yeah. I'm a mature conservation professional. Yes. Um, but between COVID and grappling with race the last year, you know, 10 times more complicated than anything we've done. And, you know, and when I talk to white people, who are sincere yeah. about trying to change themselves and and lean into these? Um, there is a fear, right? Yeah, I, I'm afraid to say the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong way. Yes, a and that can be an impediment to dialogue. It can be an impediment yes. to reaching out and allowing yourself to be vulnerable. So, could you talk to that a little yes, a little bit more? Because I, I, you know, I. We need yeah. some. We need some cheerleading, right. and I, and right. I don't mean to flip the script and uh, to use your term in a different way, you know, and make this about white people guilt. But no, no, actually. So here's what I do. You know, I can't control what you or anybody else thinks and, and does and how you come to it. I make the decision that you know I'm not going to forget anybody's humanity, and understand. You know what? I want to tell you right now, and anybody listening who may be feeling similar to you, that let me tell you right now so you don't have to worry about it anymore, you will absolutely make a mistake. <laughs> you know why you're doing it? Not because you're white. You're doing it because you're a human being. Do you think I don't make mistakes? I'm not an indigenous person. I cannot tell you how I have to, you know, I, I forgot today to make an land acknowledgement. Like there's things I just, you know, I make mistakes. You know, the, here's the thing about mistakes. You can be accountable for that. You can apologize for it and you can do differently next time. You can attend to the impact of that mistake, right? So you will make mistakes. You'll make a few because, because you're human. The beauty of it, there's nothing more powerful for me than watching a person make a mistake and then still show up at your door anyway. Um, have you all been watching? I know this is, I love movies and TV. But Kate Winslet in that HBO, um, the mayor. Um, oh my God! We're, we're right so now, so, yeah. <laughs> so there's a scene. There's just a scene, and I, oh, I'm going to give it away a little bit. But if you haven't been watching it, she's this detective in Philadelphia, and she's kind of bullheaded and moves forward. And there's a scene because of the way she moves forward without thinking that somebody gets killed that she didn't want to get killed, and she shows up at the. She knows that she goes to the door of the mother's house. She knows that she's gonna be greeted with hugs and all this stuff and the woman just eviscerated her because she, her son was taken away from her. Um, and, and she took it, she stood there and took it. And actually that said everything about her because now her healing becomes possible. That means the next time there is a next time, she's actually gonna come to that really differently. It is not about happy endings all the time. Right, we don't live in that world, right? I believe happy endings are possible sometimes. And I think sometimes there's other kinds of endings, but how are we, where do we stand? And how do we stand? And what do we stand upon? The integrity of that line, no matter what's coming at you, climate change, you know, all the stuff, <laughs> all the stuff, all the stuff, all the time. I could not be standing here if I let racism kill me because I would have been dead a long time ago. I have a thousand stories that are just personal about the ways in which the color of my skin has been used against me to limit me, to deny me right up until my 61st year. You know, it, if I, it doesn't mean I haven't been devastated. It doesn't mean I haven't been hurt. It doesn't mean I have to constantly work. It's a practice. It's a practice. My work is a practice for my healing. That's it. I, um, that Brian Stevenson, that lawyer, one of the other things he said, somebody asked him, you know, he doesn't have immediate family. He just does his work. And I'm like, I can relate. That's like me. Like, what are you doing? And he said, he said, I realized, he goes, I work with people because they, they're often in a broken place. And, you know, and what is broken about our judicial system? He says, but I realize that I do the work because I'm broken too. 
And I went, e that's it, right? It is not, I'm not being magnanimous like I'm doing it for somebody else. I'm doing it for me because how can I show up in good relationship with you if I'm not taking care of myself too, right? This is a we situation, right? It's not a you situation. I don't care what color your skin is. It's an us situation. And I have to just figure out what does that mean for how I stand in relationship with you and meet you where you are, which means sometimes I'm going to call you out. It doesn't mean that I'm always right. Mm. It just means that I'm going to get mad. You know why? Because I'm human, not just because I'm black. I'm going to get mad because I'm a human being, you know, but I don't stay mad. You know, for me, it is not the anger that drives me, it, but it's actually a cue, a clue for me in terms of where I am and what I'm feeling and what I still need to attend to, right? And how can I actually work on that as a practice, right? And how can we do that together? So you have invested an extraordinary amount of time working with white-led environmental organizations in particular and institutions like the National Park Service and on and on. Um, can, can, can you boil that work down? And, and, and I'm asking you the impossible here. Yes, you um, are, Jim. You know, I'm, I'm taking notes and I'm hearing yeah. uh, advice here and there and, and everywhere. But um, for an organization that um, is trying, is, tr yeah. is trying to find its way yeah. and take the steps while fearing not to step too far too fast and step on it or step in it, um, what's, what's your advice? How, how do we make real change? Well, Paul, and, without knowing yes. the, the actual structure and the details of your organization, I can't speak to it specifically, right? Like say here you can do this, here you can do this. But I think you can start with little things. I think I said, you know, leveraging your position and thinking about the leadership model. You know, oftentimes, and this is just sort of an example, it'll be interesting how an organization or a group will say, we want, here's what we want to do. We want to have a conversation. We want to do work. We want to change our practice. And then what they do is use the same way of outlining the way they do everything else for something that actually outlines in that way don't work. So what's the outcome? Mm. We have this much time to do it. And we have to make sure we have funding. Like there's a way within which all those things may be true, but part of what's may be holding you back is that you're applying the same framework to something that's actually demanding a different framework. So it's harder work. It means that actually yeah. we have to think differently about, you know, the way we talk about something, what we privilege and how we talk about it, who we invite to vision with us. Maybe we should be putting more emphasis on the vision, our aspiration and our set of intentions than the outcome. This is the long game. There's no end game, <laughs> don't confuse the two, to always working in relationship across difference. There is no end game. Nature tells us that all the time. There's no end game. We have, well, we hope there's no end game unless there's permanent extinction of all of us. And then that's another conversation. <laughs> but aside from that, there's no end game. So what is it about the frameworks you already have in place that may not be serving the place you're saying you want to go? What is the internal assessment that you can do as an organization around the question of diversity, equity, inclusion, and the honest assessment? And that often means inviting someone or a team in to work with you on that, that can point things out that you may not be able to see because we all wear blinders, right? Um, what is it gonna, what is it gonna cost? Not only financially, but what is it gonna cost? What are the relationships that you have in place that you have access to? So the thing is, there are a lot of organizations of color who've been doing this work for years and environmental work for years, often under the radar or to the side because they've been marginalized for a variety of reasons. What can you do to support some of those organizations? Because they're actually better at some of the things than you are. That's just the truth of it. What does it mean to build a, what does it mean to share that access to funding, to political support? See, this is where, that's why you say it's going to cost something. Like you can identify what those things are and say, well, what, what are we willing to maybe say? Not us this year, but you know, there's this group over here. They've got this, they've been doing, if they just had some more funding and opportunity, 
what, and we could build a relationship with them over time. And who knows what can emerge out of that in terms of co-working with others. We're so used to thinking there's only a limited amount in the pie and we've got to protect what we got over here because that's all that there is. And then we won't be able to do what we want to do over here. And then we're saying we want to do something else over there. <clears throat> but you can't stay over here doing it the way you've been doing it. Well, it's, it, 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 if uh, for those who are watching and, and have been following the arc of this organization, yeah. you know, it was a, three, four years ago, we changed our name. We changed the geographic scope of the organization. So this is actually a great time for us and a humbling time. Um, we had a long name. I won't repeat now that had a, it was described a geographic area that we kind of, um, pushed through, pushed out of and took in, we were bold enough to take in the city of Trenton and the immediate um, neighboring towns. And we've done some work in that very troubled city over our 70 plus years, but frankly, very little compared to the work we've done in mostly white communities. So um, we are in some ways a very mature organization, 70 plus years old, in others an infant um, with a still a brand new name and a new geographic area that we're trying to figure out and trying to find out how we can be supportive and helpful and not Bigfoot our way in. So it's, well, uh, it's, about, it's, it's actually a great timing for us. Yeah, well, it's also a great place to be. I mean, I've been thinking about, as I'm, you know, I'm doing this sort of one woman show conference workshop thing at the New York Botanical Garden. So I've been having to read old journals and look back in the past and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I've been thinking about, you know, one of the beauties I think of being a child is how many things were new, mm. how many things and how many very simple things were new. And actually doesn't mean you weren't scared of some things. I remember the first time my parents took the training wheels off the bike. That was some scary, you know, I was scared, <laughs> you know, like those simple things, you know, but also there was the excitement of it's new. And why can't we bring that kind of perspective to this moment for those places you're saying that are new and different? We're kind of in the infant stage. Beautiful. Because one of the things that infants do well, they're honest mm -hmm. and open. Hearts are open, you know, um, yeah. and, you know, and to some degree trusting. And I actually don't think that's such a bad idea for a large organization such as yourself that actually has certain amounts of supports already in place. What does it mean to be trusting? And yeah, you may get your little feelings hurt. And I know because I hate getting my feelings hurt. I get my feelings hurt. <laughs> I know what that is, you know, and you start to build up a little sense, you know, try to understand what that is. And how do you still move forward? And you might Bigfoot your way in, but you know what? You can move, take your Bigfoot out. That's <laughs> what Bigfoot does not have to stay there in that place. If you step it in and then you're like, oh, crap, I didn't want to do that. Then you go, oh, crap, I didn't want to do that. Let's take the Bigfoot out. I'm working with another organization, outdoor organization that's in Canada that has a lot of stuff on the West Coast. And they just, they were another organization that told me that I'm consulting with them. They said, you know, we... We realized even in the naming of what we were doing, like we had just, and we had to backtrack the whole thing that we thought we had made for a couple of months, all this progress. And then we had gone, oh my God, and we had to kind of do this back. And I'm like, but that's the work. That's the training. That's, that's what it is. It's not a, try not to get caught in any sort of linear idea of movement as being the only thing that has value, the linearness of it. We are not linear. I mean, you know, what? We're all over here and down here and up here. And so we can get agile at that, right? Just be intentional. You know, the important thing is not how quickly you are moving forward. That for me is not the important thing. Is that how are you doing work in service to your intention? And you are clear what your intention is. And if you can keep checking back in with your intentions, like, so is what we're doing still in service to what we said it is we wanted to do? Then if you go back, if you go forward, if you go sideways, up or down, that less that matters a whole lot less. Well, that that is great advice. I, I will say that there is probably um, nothing right now that is as energizing for our staff, and I'll say particularly our young staff. Yeah. Um, than embracing these issues, 
trying to figure them out, trying to find partners that can teach us. Um, and it is, as you've said, it's hard work. Yeah. Um, you know, you have days of great self doubt. Yes. Um, but ultimately <laughs> it's, it's, it's very exciting work and connecting, you know, what this organization has done for more than 70 years now is try to excite people about the environment and help them find their passions. Yes. Not drill it into their heads. Yes. Um, but help them find their passions. So um, that means you've got to be a, a good listener, which I think is probably the most important thing uh, about doing this DEIJ work. So uh, Carolyn, I, let me just thank you again. This has been a very quick hour, almost hour and a half. Um, I, you told me the other day, it sounded like it was even hotter in Vermont than it was down here. Today, in today is beautiful. It, the heat broke okay. out with a thunderstorm. Okay. So, That's great. Uh, but um, thank you again. Good luck to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you well. I, I, I see you're making um, great change with a lot of organizations. And um, I, I hope we connect in person again sometime very soon. Me too. Okay. Yes. So, okay. and, and thank you to those that, of you that tuned in on um, YouTube and Facebook Live through our website. Um, we're thrilled to have tonight's um, speaker, Carolyn Finney, did every bit that I hoped and much more tonight. Um, we have a number of other programs coming forward, including some that are outside um, if you don't know, we just opened the Watershed Center up again for the first time in 14 months, at least on the weekends, and we'll be opening seven days a week um, in just a few weeks. Uh, we're, we're returning to a little bit more semblance of, of normal or something that approximates normal. So we hope um, if you live in the area that you'll come out and see us, hike our trails, enjoy our center, um, and interact with our, with our staff. So. Um, Thanks again. I think we'll wrap it up right here. Thanks for tuning in. Um, good luck to you all and uh, stay healthy. Thanks again.